Amen. That's our heart's desire is to be like Jesus. Amen. Uh, let's take our Bibles, please. Thanks, Sister Beatrice. Uh, we're going to be turning to the Gospel of St. Luke as we do a review on uh, the sermon here, Jesus Keeps All His Appointments. Praise the Lord. Are you happy? Praise the Lord. Luke seven thirty six, and we're going to read down to 50. Luke 7, and starting at verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner saw, when she saw that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the anointment. Now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who, uh, who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have some what to say unto thee. Okay, now he's in trouble. And now he's, now he's in trouble. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, and the one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when he had uh, nothing to pay, he frankly forgave both of them. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, uh, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, and gavest, uh, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Uh, thou gavest me uh, no, no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil, thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with anointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom it little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said unto the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Amen. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, Gracious Father, gracious Father, we thank you for forgiving our sins, Lord. We thank you for making a way for us, Father. And Lord, and as we go through uh, this sermon here that was preached so many years ago by your prophet, which we believe to be the fulfillment of Malachi 4, uh, Lord, uh, I pray that you open our eyes even more so. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. So Jesus keeps uh, all his appointments. Uh, we're going. We're doing this one here. Yeah, praise the Lord. So there's a set time for everything. There is. Uh, there are times and there are seasons uh, in our life. Uh, there are uh, seasons all along this path of destiny. This this path of discovery that we are on in this world to find out who and what we are and our calling in Christ. There are, there are different junctions, and at every junction there will be tests, and there will be uh, things to see what you are made out of. God will test the human side, and God will also test the deity side. Uh, there will be word tests, and there will be tests with the world. In fact, Brother Ram said, we will be tested with sin. So uh, at different junctions, uh, at different points, our character is always uh, challenged. Uh, it's the word test, but we have appointed times, uh, we have chosen paths to walk on if we are the predestinated and elected of God. Because the psalmists write in Psalms uh, 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. But it's very interesting, uh, it says the, the steps of a good man, because the steps of a bad man... He just stumbles through life. He could be religious, uh, he could be a sympathizer with the Word of God, but the steps of a good man 
uh, ordered of the Lord. Now, it doesn't say a good woman, it doesn't say a good child, it doesn't say a good boy, it doesn't say a good girl. It specifically, it says a good man, and the reason it says man, the lexicon tells us because it's putting emphasis on strength and the ability to fight. And that's what we, the, the devil will challenge you at every step. Now, so whether you're a brother or a sister, you're still a good man. Because he created man in his image, both male and female. He created them, man, son of man. So the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So it's to do with strength. It's to do with the ability to fight, to fight the good fight of faith that we have. Uh, it's the strength uh, to deny yourself, your own lust, the sin that so easily besets you. Everybody in this room, nobody is exempt. There is a sin that so easily besets you. And sometimes you mess up more than you do well. But it's the, the fight... The fight of faith, the good, the good fight, and the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Amen. Uh, and we are the ones that should delight in the Word of God. Amen. So, I got some competition with David. Uh, Jesus keeps all of his appointments. Uh, paragraph 50. He says, And yet, as busy as he was, uh, but you can never invite him but what he'll come. I don't care what the situation is. It's very important. I don't care what the situation is. I don't know where you find yourself. I don't know how condensed or how, how uh, persistent the storm. Uh, if you invite him, he will come. I don't care what the situation is. He'll come. If you can just humble yourself to the word of God. Paragraph 97, he says, Then Jesus, although busy as he was, <laughs> and his busy schedule, he always keeps his appointment. You can depend on that, he keeps his appointment. And uh, we being the right of Jesus Christ, we have a right to a conference anywhere, anytime, under any condition. It doesn't matter. I don't care, I, I don't care uh, what the sin was, we're serving a God that is greater than your sinning. God is a better redeemer than you are a sinner. But if you're a good man, if you're a good man, then uh, you delight in the word of the Lord. But if you're a bad man, you just stumble on and make excuses. As soon as you start making excuses, it shows that you're not really sincere about what you're doing wrong. It just means that you just, you're, you're, it's theatre. Then Jesus, although busy as he was and his busy schedule, he always keeps his appointments. You can depend on that. He keeps his appointments. In 99, he says, uh, but look, sitting over against the wall. Now, this is the Lord Jesus. Sitting against the wall, not being noticed. In another place, Brother Brown said, red-faced. Human element, embarrassed. Face burning red with embarrassment. Knowing he was rejected and invited to make a laughing stock. But he keeps his appointments. But look, sitting over against the wall, not being noticed, was Jesus. Uh, he kept his appointment. He come. He always keeps his word, all his promises. He fulfills all his promises. Amen. Now, Brother Ram uh, talks about the presence of the Lord, paragraph 62, and he, he just throwed it off. There was not nothing, talking about the courier, but just, just an ordinary message. Uh, he, he had to deliver the, the courier that came to Jesus. I trust you listened to the sermon. Mm-hmm. He just sat there uh, and uh, he was uh, in his presence and that was all it was to him. It didn't mean nothing to him. If we really understood the severity and the gravity uh, of this message, we wouldn't have theatre. We wouldn't be messing around. There's an eye watching the presence of the Lord, when the presence of the Lord comes in, and you know it, everybody in the room knows it, it melts coldness, it melts formality. The presence of the Lord, it, it scatters the darkness, and the Bible says it's the refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord. But we've got to realize that we have to be conscious, conscious. Brother Tim took a whole sermon of, on this not so long ago. We have to be conscious of his presence, that uh, you are never alone. Never, never alone. If you're in the dark... He can see, never alone. If, if I ascend up to heaven, he's there. If I make my bed in hell, he's there. If I go to Mars, he's there. The presence of the Lord. Amen. So we need to, we need to, uh, we need to recognize that. But what happens with sinners, sinners, uh, they are calloused. Their, their conscience even, and we'll get to it, is seared with a hot iron. 
they're, they're not conscious, they're callous to the fact that Jesus is watching. And the backsliders are hardened to it. And the religious just play dumb. But you know, you know, there's an eye watching. Hmm. Amen. So uh, this message, according to uh, Revelations 10, the mighty angel descending was so that the bride could ascend into the presence of the Lord. Jesus said that where I am, he's not talking about location, he's talking about the position as sonship. Where I am, there ye can be also. Amen. It's, uh, it's all about blending into the oneness of God. <clears throat> now, re revelation comes from the presence of the Lord. Uh, the refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. Your theophany came from the presence of the Lord. Uh, revelation comes from the presence of the Lord. And when you have a revelation, you're hearing from your theophany, which is from the presence of the Lord. So the bride is the presence of the Lord. And let's not be men like Jonah running from the presence of the Lord. We've got to face it. Who we are in Christ. Mm. Praise the Lord. The prophet says, uh, we, we then enter into the presence of the Lord with an anointing of brethren together in unity. The word allows us to enter into that eternal place. We can enter into the, the holiest of holies and let the veil drop behind us because when you're in there and the world is out, it's a soundproof room and it's just a relationship between you and God. The presence of God. The presence of God is not out there somewhere. The presence of God is right here. We have been invited into all that he is. Cain, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord because he was a proud, arrogant, defiant, religious man. But the grace of God said, hey, if you just do what your brother does. The grace of God even gave Rome room to repent. The presence of the Lord. Let us not be... Uh, a man that's running from the presence of the Lord. Be a good man, a good man, a good man that, that has his footsteps ordered of the Lord. This path of destiny takes you back to where you came from. This is a message of redemption. This is a message of restoration. If you came from God, then you've got to go back to God. So the presence of the Lord is sitting on the chair that you chose this evening. Second Corinthians 3.18 says, but we all, this is very interesting, if you want to, in fact, please take your Bibles and open it because I want, I want to show you something. Uh, Second Corinthians 3.18, I'll be good and wait. Didn't Joshua preach well at, at 500 miles an hour? I said, don't worry, after about 30 years, you'll probably start slowing down. 2 Corinthians 3.18 Got it? Okay. But we all, with open face, beholding. Now, now that's a, the important thing is open face. That means the veil has been taken off of us. But we all, with open face, so it's the unveiling of God. But we all with open face are beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. So you're looking, if, you, if the veil is off your face or the veil is off your understanding and the, the, the God of this world, Satan, has blinded their minds, he's blinded their conscience. But if we have open face, if the, if the veil is taken away, then we can behold in the glass, which is the reflection of the word, uh, a change into the same image from glory to glory. So the, so the image that you are seeing is not the image that you are. Mm hmm. It's just you're being changed into it. But it's your eternal representation is the reflection that's bouncing out of the mirror. That is the presence of the Lord. And the just will walk by faith. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Walking by faith. From glory to glory, we are changed into the same image. Into the presence of the Lord. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So open face, open face, without a, without a veil, without, without, without a mask, without religious theatre. Amen? 
without masquerading. I'm talking about the original you. Chosen in God before the foundation of the world. Uh, with open face, you can read you. You can read you in the book. Mm -hmm. Amen. So the real you is the glory of the Lord. And God said, I won't share my glory with anybody. Therefore, you're not anybody. So we change from glory to glory, word to word, to what I really am. Amen. Not what I am now, but what the mirror is calling to me. The mirror, the word is calling to me. Amen. Uh, paragraph uh, 6, Brother Ram says, And now speaking this morning on the thought of the church growing, see, coming like a seed in the ground, and that seed, as it's planted, grows from glory unto glory, and it becomes after a while into a blossom and then goes back to the seed. That's like the original seed that was planted. Amen? That means if you take the next seed and put it in the ground, Same thing. When the bright tree blossoms, Brother Bram said it'll be the tree of life. That's like the original seed that was planted, and so the church has, and so has the church been. We've been growing, growing, growing to that position. Paragraph 22, he says now, he said that's exactly when the church and the word has to be one. Just, he says, like Jesus and God was one. Oh, there's no room now for drama. There is no room for fear. There is no room for uh, the thoughts of failure. There is no room to be thinking about your future falling to pieces if you and the Word is one. It can only get better in Christ. The world will get worse, but you've got to get better because you were made marvelous and there is actually no room of there is no room for improvement. If it's the word. The word you. You can't improve the word you. And if God makes something, if you are the workmanship of Almighty God, you are made marvellous and you are made perfect. It's just stop the drama, drop the excuses, turn your back on sin and get right with Jesus. Mm. That's exactly when the church and the word has to be one, like Jesus and God was one, just exactly. They, God, God has, uh, was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And so will Christ have to be in the church, the anointed of the word, to make everything fulfilled. And that's the capstone. I'm not waiting for the capstone. The capstone is not, uh, it's, uh, it's not an event, it's a group of people. That's the capstone that comes upon the last church age, not the Laodicea now. That means we've got to be in another bright age, another age, yeah? Now, it's calling out of that a bride out of a church, a church out of a church, and otherwise, just like he came, a nation out of a nation in Egypt. And now we're living in that day. Not Laodicea, that day, capstone day. And we're grateful for these great things that we've been seeing. Now, Brother Brown talks about opportunity in paragraph 102. He says, what happened to the footwash flunky? Remember, we can, we can fast track because you've all heard the sermon. What happened to that uh, footwash flunky? How did he ever miss that opportunity? I wish I would have had his opportunity. Oh my, if I'd known he'd been coming, I'd been standing I'd been standing there waiting for him. I'd, I'd be ready for it. How did he do it? Now, let's not condemn him too much because we might do the same thing and not know it. Ah, and not know it. So who could the other Jesus be? Might be the person sitting next to you, discerning the Lord's body. Now, let's not condemn him too much because we might do the same thing and not know it. See, he, he missed him. Oh, my. Let's, let's not miss each other. Let's not, let's, not, uh, let's not misunderstand that it's a body, the body of Christ. Let's be very careful how we treat each other. Amen. The opportunity. 
You know, Brother Bram said, we all stand at the door of God's opportunity. God's opportunity. You are standing at the door of God's opportunity. You are what the Lord has been waiting for for a very long time. Amen. We, we have opportunities. Just let me say some things that we have said many times and then we'll go a little deep. But we have opportunities that St. Paul never dreamed of. Goodness me. Uh, we, we talk about the full word and full effect. We talk about the opening of the book. We talk about the token of life of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, the opportunity, this, we have an opportunity that makes a complete separation from sin. We have uh, the opportunity, uh, the, 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 uh, the opportunity to receive revelation, the refreshing from the Lord to, uh, to change our conscience so that we can be a separated people from uh, even ourselves. Uh, that we don't no longer condemn ourselves. Hmm? We have an opportunity to walk with Jesus. We have uh, many, many people have lost that opportunity. Many people turn their back on that opportunity. Uh, the courier lost that opportunity. He just thought he had a message, like brother was preaching. Brother Tim was preaching the other week. Uh, it was just business, just strictly business, and he lost his opportunity to stop and worship God and ask for the forgiveness of his sins. Uh, Simon lost the opportunity. Um, at the party, <laughs> Simon lost the opportunity to watch Jesus feed himself. Praise the Lord. The prostitute seized upon that opportunity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we, have, we, have an, we, we have a God who was sitting there, as you're writing down these numbers, uh, a long time ago before there was even an atom. And he was thinking to himself, I've got to give myself a purpose of being. God wanted to know what it would be like to be excited because if you know everything and you do everything and you can't add anything to your own intelligence, uh, there is no aha moment for God. There is no point of excitement for God. There is no decision for God because he cannot make another decision. He, he's God. So God said, I need to give myself a purpose of being. So uh, after the fall, uh, Brother Bram dramatizes it, and uh, we know it's a lot of poetic license, but God was wondering, I wonder why they, they didn't trust me. Uh, all, all through the Old Testament, uh, with Israel, God was wondering, I wonder what it's like to worship me. So God wanted to know, what does it feel like to worship God? So the only way for God to know that is to step out of being God and step into his own creation. So the all-knowing God that is external, that spans all time and space, Elohim, uh, the self-existing one, uh, cannot be excited in that state. But if he's in that state, he can be excited. Brother Bram said in the garden, for the first time, God felt the chill of death. On his back. He can't, he can't have that experience as Elohim, the one that spans all time and space, because he knows everything. He just, you cannot add, you cannot, you, you cannot excite God, you cannot challenge God, but God wanted to know what would it be like to be challenged. I mean, to really be challenged to the point, to, to the point of changing my own mind. And he, 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 he fulfilled that, or he, he, uh, he experienced that in the garden when Jesus changed his mind. The only way that God can be excited now is to be immorphed in his bride. So you offer God an opportunity. We talk about opportunity. We talk about opportunities that Paul never had. But this is the opportunity now that God has been waiting for. Christ, the mystery of God, brother and said, God, one of the preeminence of one man, Jesus Christ. And then uh, just let me, just let me dramatize, just let me paraphrase. Uh, God enjoyed it so much having that in one man. He said, I'm going to do it again in a multi-membered body. There's going to be thousands of them. And God said, I'm going to feel the sting of death. I'm going to feel the pressure of the world. I'm going to feel the bite. And I'm going to overcome. But just, Brother Ram said, just in perfect faith, perfect faith, Brother Ram said, uh, just as Jesus had to recognize who he was, we have to recognize who we are. You are God's opportunity. And now Jesus, this Jesus now, this Jesus has to keep his appointment. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. The opportunity that God has been waiting for, seize upon that opportunity. The opportunity to live a life that's worthy of this gospel. God, God wants to know the pressure of the battle. God wanted to, God uh, as Elohim could not experience fear, but as you, you can experience fear. 
God as Elohim doesn't know nothing about what if. But you do. God can experience what is it like to worship an all-knowing God. If you really understood, if God sits and he thinks, if he really understood uh, that I am present, that I, I am Jehovah Shama, I'm present, I'm, I'm everywhere, I see everything, I understand everything, why, why do they live like that? Let me go and experience it. And there you are, fighting with the world, fighting with your own mind, fighting with the desires to go into the world. It's God's opportunity. <laughs> Standing at the door of God's opportunity. I thank God that God, I thank God that Jesus cancelled my appointment with hell. I have a divine appointment with a rapture. Jesus keeps all his appointments. Amen. The Jesus of today is going to keep all of his appointments. Who's going to make himself ready? The bride will make herself ready. That scripture that I was trying to find the other night is Revelation 21 and 11. Her glory, her light, and the glory of the Lord. Paragraph 103, he says, Notice, uh, he comes today to our callings too. He comes in our midst, I don't want to say this, but I must say it. Uh, and in our midst, he's uh, understood among us, uh, sitting there just as dirty to the people as he was then. That's exactly right. Calling him holy rollers. Mm -mm. And everything else, and yet we cry for a revival, and he comes, and when he does come, we treat him about like they did then. Where does the refreshing come from? The presence of the Lord. Where does revelation come from? The presence of the Lord. Where does your theophany come from? The presence of the Lord. But we are men running from the presence of the Lord and shying away because of peer pressure. And remember, a tradition, tradition is peer pressure from dead people. Mm. But the word of God is not peer pressure from dead people because Jesus rose again. This is an I am God. This is an I am God. But tradition makes the word of God of none effect. I call them holy rollers. Paragraph 138, he says, and that's what we ought to do. We ought to give him our best, everything we are, our youthful life. Not wait till we're old and dying. Give the best we got to him. Amen. And then he talks about ashamed. Paragraph 207. He says, you, you, you read the same Bible that I read. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Jesus of dirty feet. And haven't you got the real Christian spunk about you to stand up and take up for it? Look like you should have. Poor me, I'm a little church mouse. Don't talk like that. We're too far. We're too close to rapture now. Don't, don't talk about poor me. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Don't talk about poor me. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Poor me, what? Poor me, what? You're deity. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Don't, don't, don't. Don't say the word of God is not correct. Amen? Amen. <laughs> ashamed, ashamed. Be ashamed of your old nature, but do not be ashamed of the gospel. Be ashamed of your old nature, be ashamed of your sins, be ashamed of your iniquities, but do not be ashamed of what's in the mirror. Ashamed. <clears throat> when it comes to living a Christian life, Brother Bram says in a token, you can't be a secret boy about it anymore. Got to come out in the open, stand out, stand out, show your colours. Praise the Lord. Step up to the plates and be counted for what you are as the Son of God. Don't cower down. Don't pour me. Don't get depressed. What do you get depressed for? You're thinking about the problem rather than the promise. Philippians, uh, Philippians 1 verse 20 says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life 
or by death. Amen. Ashamed. God's, <clears throat> God's not ashamed to call us brethren. Why would I be ashamed to call God brethren? He's the prince of the kings of the earth. Revelation chapter 1. He's the prince, he's the prince of the kings of the earth. Why doesn't, it say, why doesn't it say he's the king of the kings of the earth? It says he's the prince of the kings of the earth. And the reason he says he's a prince is because the kings of the earth have to birth him. A prince is a child of a king. And we're the kings and the priests. And he's the prince of the kings of the earth. And if he's not ashamed to call us brethren, then why on earth would we be ashamed to say that when you see me? You see the Father. Jesus is going to keep all his appointments. And his times and his junctions and his predestinated time and the Jesus of the day is going to keep his appointment. They'll call him holy rollers. Amen. I'm not ashamed to identify myself as deity. In the way they call heresy. Imagine if they found out what we believe. You can imagine the uh, YouTube channels. <laughs> but in the way they call heresy, there's no problem. I, that's the way I choose to worship the God of my fathers. Amen. I'm not ashamed. I'm ashamed, I'm ashamed of my faults. I'm ashamed of my, of my failings. I'm ashamed uh, of, uh, of my iniquities, especially when it takes me that sin that so easily besets me. But as soon as I find myself in the wrong, I shake myself and I repent. I'm ashamed of myself. I stand before the Lord red-faced and thank Him for the blood. But I won't stay in that state of shame. Because there's only one place that God will have fellowship, and that's under the blood. So we have uh, predestinated appointments, and not only do we have predestinated appointments, but friend, hallelujah, you've got predestinated people that will walk across your path, specially designed by God himself to help your character. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Sometimes I think I know, I know why I don't have to go through the tribulation period. I've got enough hell now. But the hell that you've got now is to get you into a place where Jesus, Jesus, the holy rollers, can keep their appointment. Praise the Lord. Last thing I want to do is bring a reproach upon this message. You'll bring a reproach. Don't water it down. If you don't understand it, shh. But don't water it down. Don't try to make it palatable to mainstream religion. This is a crazy religion if you're going to use your mind. But when you see me, you see the Father. Paragraph 100. That's like uh, some of our modern revivals, the Frenchmen call, uh, they call him Jesus, Jesus with dirty feet. Could you imagine it? He was invited and he come. And there he is uh, and got in some way, he got in some way and unnoticed, he set over as a wallflower. He was just as much out of place there. He is in some of our modern revivals, banquets, so-called religious gatherings. You come, we, we, we sing that song, burn, burn, Holy Spirit, burn in me. So Jesus comes and we say, when we hear the word preached uh, about the unveiling of God, we say, no, that cannot be. And he sits there with dirty feet. Mm. The prophet talks about the conscience, your, your, your conscience, uh, 19, uh, paragraph 61, he says, but, so dot, 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 that means I've broken into the paragraph. But I think that's what's the matter today. People are not conscious of it. Conscious of it. They see the scripture exactly identified, but they're so conscious of, uh, and they're not conscious of who it is. Uh, they'll they'll see something and they say, "Oh, uh, that was wonderful. That was fine," uh, but you're not con conscious of what it is. If it was, there would be a repentance going on, a weeping, and crying. People are not uh, con conscious of this colossal, that's a good word, colossal, this huge revelation 
that is waiting to break over our lives. Conscious. We get focused on the outside. Conscious. <clears throat> Not conscious that your, your words, Jesus said your words will justify you and also condemn you. Your, your own words. People are not conscious that their words and their actions carry consequence. Uh, Timothy, and Paul writes to Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, says, uh, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Crazy religious people. Speaking hypocrisies. And the reason that they do that, Brother Brown says, uh, they lie to themselves. They just keep on lying to themselves until they believe their own lie. Then when they believe their, their own lie, now they've got their own religion, and their conscience is seared, and they'll be damned for convincing themselves that something that was wrong is right. Conscious. They just lie to themselves. Second Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 2 says, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Amen. Not handling the word of God deceitfully. Again, uh, Paul says uh, in 1 Timothy 1 5, he says, Now the end of the commandment is charity. Mm hmm. Eighth day, bright age, capstone. Now the end of the commandment is charity, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. So it's got to come a place, it's got to come a time, friends, because you're going to backslide every day until the body change. That's what the prophet said, right? It's going to come a time where you can, a good man, a good man can see past that. A good man, a man that is able to fight against the facts. That sin that so easily besets you, I'm going to keep my appointment. But there's a courier at every stage, there's at every, at every, just waiting behind every corner. There's a voice of condemnation. You're not good enough. But Jesus made me plenty good enough. As long as I don't handle the word deceitfully. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And I thank God for the blood. Hallelujah. Amen. So don't, uh, don't focus too much on world events. Focus more on these events. Modern events made clear by prophecy. Modern, you are a modern event made clear by prophecy. You are the present stage of God's own ministry. You are what God has been waiting for. You're the only one that can offer God excitement. You're the only one that can offer God the aha moment. Timothy again, 1 Timothy 1.19 says, holding, holding faith and a good conscience, good conscience, a good conscience, which some, having put away uh, concerning faith, have made shipwreck. I tell you what, if you play games with the word, if you play games with the word and uh, mess around and then your conscience becomes uh, seared with a hot iron and then you say, oh, but Jesus is love. Ah, no, 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 now you face a Jesus that is a judge. But if you come clean, Gracious Father. Gracious Father. Uh, Hebrews 10, 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Amen. There's no deception like self-deception. Just line up with the Word of God. We've got opportunities that St. Paul never dreamed of. A paragraph 58. He said, that's why, I think that, uh, that's why I think so much healing becomes a failure. Or professed healing, because in the first place the people are not ready for healing. They won't confess their wrongs. The Bible says, confess your faults oh, one to another and pray one for another. And we're not willing to do that. So that, that's all in this uh, sermon that we are going through. It's paragraph 58. There's got to be a place. I want, I want a word. I want a religion. I want a book of Acts religion. 
I want a reality. Amen. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, Brother Ram said, don't you want God to honor your prayers? Mm. Repentance. Uh, paragraph 100, uh, 109 says, that's what this cruel, hell-bound world ought to do tonight is repent of their sins. That's what uh, these church members ought to do. <laughs> church members. That's what these church members ought to do. Repent of their unbelief. Stand up for him. Who's he? Holy rollers. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he identifies himself just like he did then. What was he? Didn't look like a god. But he was. Repentance. We want to purge out the old leaven. We want to repent of our iniquities. And before you can receive that pardoning grace, there has to be something real and genuine. In Israel, when it crosses over from the right-hand side of the menorah, the four candlesticks to the, to the other side, Brother Ann said, the, those three remaining candlesticks is Israel. So there'll be the trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. So as soon as they hear the message, then the next feast is... Uh, the atonement, which is afflict your soul. Afflict your soul. Lord, I'm not just saying I'm sorry. I'm melting. I am pouring my heart out like a drink offering. Lord, I repent. Amen. Then you'll get his attention. But Brother Brown says too many people come before God and say, sorry about that old boy. Can you imagine it? Sorry about that old boy. <laughs> repentance repentance but I thank God for the, for the bride of Jesus Christ that uh, Jesus Christ is a better saviour than we are sinners uh, but he is waiting for a repentance Amen. we want to purify our own conscience we want to clean up our life it's obvious that you can't just go and do what you want because you can't even pray now without a token living a life that's worthy of this gospel now, uh, as, we, as, as we close, the devil, this thing uh, that goes around as a roaring lion, the devil wants you to think that he is some ugly, nasty, distorted, scary-looking something. Uh, he wants you to think that because when he comes, you'll miss him because of deception. Brother Bram said, no, this devil's charming. He said, well dressed, hair, hair, hair flicked over to one side, nice suit, briefcase. Charming. And talk the word. He's cunning, he's charming, he's a deceiver. He is an impersonator of Christianity. He's also known as Beelzebub. <laughs> Beelzebub. And, and Beelzebub, it boils down, the literal translation is actually the Lord of the Flies. He's King Fly. Yeah? He's the Lord of the Flies. And the reason it's the flies is because flies like to buzz around stinky dead things. They get in your face. I don't know if you've ever been uh, in a place where there's not much... Uh, say, when I remember being out in the, um, the Great Sandy Desert in Western Australia. It's just dry. It's just dry. Hardly, this is dry. And the flies would crawl up your nose, they would crawl into your ears, they would try to crawl into your eyes because they, 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 they're desperate and you had to pull them out and pull them out and pull them out. They're just a pest. Beelzebub is a pest. And he likes to hang around dirty things, stinky things. Uh, and he wants you to think that he's an ugly, nasty uh, tail. He's got no tail, brother. He doesn't have a tail, he doesn't have horns. He's, he'll present well. Amen. <laughs> but he is attracted to smells. He's the Lord of the flies. Paul said, for the bride of Jesus Christ, to life, we smell like life. He said, and to death, we smell like death. And so that's why the devil knows who you are. Because he likes the smell of death. Mm? But you've got to keep your appointments. You've got many appointments along this road of discovery and at every appointment because you smell like death to death, 
The devil has a right to challenge you on everything that you do and everything that you think and everything that you look away. And he's watching how, you know, I, and I, we've all fallen for it because we we're just all fallen for it and we won't make excuses. But when you see a well-dressed Jezebel and Brother Ramsey, she can dress to kill. And when you look at it, you look away like this. <laughs> you just take your time. Repent. Just repent. But to death, you smell like death. Praise the Lord. That's why your name's on hell's hit list. Because you smell like death. And you attract the devil. And Brother Brown said you were actually sent here to be tested by sin. But you are the ones that give God an opportunity to overcome. You're the ones that give God the opportunity to resist the devil. You know, God, God cannot have an enemy as Elohim. Because he'd just speak that thing out of existence. In fact, he knows he can read the enemy's thought before the enemy even has a thought. He, God, as Elohim, doesn't have an enemy. But sitting in the chair. Now God can say, I have an enemy. Keep your appointments. When the Lord of the Fly challenges you as you walk out the door, keep your appointments. Act like a son of God. Amen? You're the genuine thing. You're the last stand. You're the workmanship of Almighty God. You're not a mistake. You're here for a purpose. Keep every appointment. And when you mess up, repent. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow. Godly sorrow. Uh, not, uh, not to be repented of. So don't be sorry that you're sorry. But, this, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So godly, godly sorrow uh, works to salvation and just a world sorry old boy, just a worldly repentance leads to death. And the Lord of the flies is waiting. Praise the Lord. Last quote. Praise the Lord, are you happy? Paragraph 165 and 166. Notice, Simon didn't give him anything to wash his feet with, but he had the best water that there could be. God bless you, Sister Beatrice. Just think, the tears of a repentant sinner washed the dirt off of Jesus' feet. Tears of a sinner's eyes washing the dirt from his feet. O oh, men and women tonight, when you see the reproach upon the gospel and we're so starchy, uh, it would take uh, all the makeup off of our face if we cried a tear and we look horrible to get on the street. What are you going to be? What are you going to be when you face the portals of heaven yonder? With such a message as this, with such an opportunity, you are the door of God's opportunity. So we have appointments. We have, I think of the great appointment, the great appointment, the, the change of the body. Jesus is going to keep that appointment. Who's Jesus? Holy rollers. <laughs> and, when, and, when, and when you meet the devil and it all seems to be falling apart, don't look at it as some chaos. It's an appointment. Because the footsteps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. There's appointments. What's your reaction at the appointment? Keep the appointments. Prove yourself. Let every man prove his own work. Praise the Lord. God bless your hearts. Let's, uh, let's sing near the cross.